Uh, thanks for joining us, Dr. Walshak. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have, I'm sure everybody in the audience has lots of questions. I do as well. Let's start with the sort of big question, which is, which cancers have been most responsive to immunotherapy and, and why, and which ones have not and why? This is a really important question for a lot of reasons. I think um, we, we know that most people who have melanoma, which is a skin cancer, will respond to immunotherapy. Um, now with current regimens, it's up to about 60% of people that will respond to immunotherapy. Um, but um, there are other cancers on that list as well. Kidney cancer, lung cancer, specifically lung cancer that is found in people who have smoked, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer just actually had an approval, um, for be also tobacco related, um, and some kinds of lymphoma uh, as well. Which cancers have proven less adaptive to immunotherapy? Yeah, this is a, a really important area of, of research. So in general, um, some of the more common cancers, aside from tobacco related lung cancer, um, but colorectal cancer taken as one giant category, which gets to one of the facets of the last conversation that we are used to talking about big categories, breast cancer as one big category are generally not as responsive as other kinds of cancer, but we're now recognizing that there are subsets of people within those categories, such as women with triple negative breast cancer, which is a term for breast cancers that don't have the receptor for hormones like estrogen or progesterone and don't have the HER2 protein overexpressed. Those patients seem to respond to immunotherapy. Um, and colon cancer patients who have a, a rare abnormality where the autocorrect mechanism that prevents errors in copying the DNA, um, those patients have a very high likelihood of responding to immunotherapy. So teasing out a lot of those cues and clues, we believe that the cancers that respond to immunotherapy the most are the ones that have more genetic damage. So, so I feel like what we're edging towards is kind of a whole, not a wholesale, well maybe, I don't know, a wholesale redefinition of cancer, right? Not as breast cancer or colon cancer, but as sort of genetic profiles that, that happen to attack different areas of the body. Is that accurate? I think it's very accurate and very insightful. Um, and it gets again to a topic of the last discussion where we're not going to be diagnosing cancer for much longer solely based upon the way the cells appear in shape and size under the microscope. We're now going to be diagnosing cancer partly on that, but also on which genes have gone wrong, what proteins um, are abnormally expressed. How, do, how does immunotherapy s see the tumor, for lack of a better term? Yeah, if, if the, our immune systems are programmed to see things that look different than our normal bodies. That's, that's what they are designed to do. Immune cells seek out things that don't look like a normal body part, and in general, you know, historically those were infections. But now we know that if a tumor cell has an error in its DNA or a funny looking protein as a result of that, the immune system only surveys for structure. It doesn't survey for function. So if a cancer cell has a funny piece of protein on it as a result of a genetic mutation that makes it look not like normal self, the immune system is gonna say, aha, that's something foreign, attack it. And that's what we think is one of the bases of the responsiveness of immunotherapy in some cancers. Well, um, I was reading an old uh, three or four year old interview with you in the New York Times where you described immunotherapy as a therapy that lives rather than a medicine that passes in and out of the system. And the idea that it would sort of, immunotherapy is inherently integrated into the, the human body. Do you see there being future, you know, different applications for immunotherapy beyond cancer treatment? I do think so. Um, one of the currently used immunotherapies, um, you know, the, the class of medicines um, called PD-1 blocking drugs, which are probably the most commonly used immunotherapies, um, are thought to also potentially have relevance in the treatment of chronic hepatitis as well, kind of uh, rescuing the immune system from this sort of chronic state of exhaustion that can occur. When, when you think about immunotherapy, and certainly there have been advances made in the last few years, but how dangerous is it at this point? 
How dangerous is the therapy? For a patient. Like any cancer therapy, um, immunotherapy can cause side effects and toxicities. And in fact, some people have died from the side effects of immunotherapy. There's no question about that. Um, there is a learning curve for oncologists and other physicians and nurses to understand the side effects that can occur with immunotherapy because they're different than the usual side effects that we were trained to recognize in using chemotherapy. Um, these are side effects that look like inflammation, like autoimmune disease, and they need to be treated in that way with immune suppressing medicines like prednisone, uh, not with anti-nausea medicines or, uh, or pain medicines. They need to be treated um, because of the way that they arose. So um, as time has gone on, and it's only been a short period of time that immunotherapy has been in wider spread use, maybe the past five to seven years, we've gotten much better at recognizing the earliest signs of the uh, severe side effects. And in general, they are much less likely to cause severe symptoms and much less likely to cause death. What, what about when you talk to patients and say, well, how about we do a clinical trial? I mean, talk to me a little bit about the response there and, and going through that process with a patient. Um, we get different responses when we bring up the idea of clinical trials. Some people are very interested in clinical trials. They, they come to us because um, we are a research focused institution. We also, of course, give outstanding state-of-the-art care. Um, but some people are inherently interested in it. Other people will, will take a step back and say, oh no, I'm not a guinea pig, right? And right. so, uh, you know, I, I recognize when, you know, my job is not to be an arm twister. Um, you know, my, my job is to introduce options to people who are looking for different ways to approach their disease. Um, so sometimes over time, you know, as we um, go through different standard options and someone will say, well, what do we do next? We come back to a clinical trial as, as a topic. You have to work your way around back to so, that place. And, so, and some people, ask, other people will say, I want to be part of a trial first thing. Um, speaking of patients, we know that you've had several high-profile patients, among them former President Jimmy Carter, who is treated with a combination of surgery, radiation, and immunotherapy. Correct me if I'm wrong. You certainly know better so, than I. So, um, well, let's just the L go by. Um, <laughs> but um, I just want to... Jim, the President Carter is not my patient. Sure. Um, I didn't treat him. I had the, the great privilege to um, have some conversations with his physicians, and he was gracious enough to acknowledge um, some advice from my group. So I don't want to take credit. Give it, sure, <laughs> sure. Very modest of yeah. you. Um, given that and understanding that yeah. you were not treating him directly, do you think any one of those treatment courses, surgery, radiation, or immunotherapy, was more responsible than the other for his outcome? I don't know if anybody's smart enough to answer that. <laughs> um, I actually... I, well, but, but that's actually a good question. Well, it, after the fact, do you guys, do doctors, and you know, especially at high level, look back and say, is there a post, not postmortem, that's absolutely <laughs> no, the wrong word to yeah. use, forgive me, but is there a, a sort of analysis of, of treatment after the fact? I think what we're now recognizing is that it is the integration of multiple different treatment modalities that probably is the best course forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, in the case of a patient who had a similar situation to President Carter, all of those different avenues of therapy were important. Surgery to, um, to make the diagnosis and remove that side of disease. Radiation therapy to the brain because that's a tough area to treat with immunotherapy. And then because of the very high likelihood of disease remaining after surgery and radiation, giving immunotherapy to hopefully, um, for lack of a better word, clean up any microscopic amount of, of cancer that was left. So I think the best answer is that these combinational, combination approaches are really where we're headed. So assuming that we do move forward in a combinational approach, I mean, one of the things that I know, uh, one of the concerns that folks have is the cost here, right? One of the prime immunotherapy drugs costs, I think, $12,500. When you think about that and the, and your hope to use immunotherapy as part of a combined regimen, how concerned is the medical community about the extraordinary cost of some of these drugs? I mean, it's, it's, it's a real concern. Um, I think, you know, uh, I was speaking with someone earlier today that we're not just providers, we're consumers as well. So I'm a patient too. So I'm 
I'm very concerned with how much things cost because I'm part of the healthcare system mm -hmm. from, from both ends. So there's no question that some of these medicines cost a lot of money. Um, and how we use them most intelligently, how we can uh, most accurately perhaps select patient populations that are most likely to benefit um, will help us to use them more effectively. The value of, of of cancer care is an extraordinarily important topic. Well, uh, speaking of the value of cancer care, I know you're involved with Sean Parker's efforts on um, developing immunotherapy, the Center for Immun Immunotherapy. Wh how is that different? Yeah, I think um, Sean's insights were first to recognize that immunotherapy um, is the disruptive technology of cancer <laughs> medicine, and that really plays to his philosophy. Sure, that the word disruption, yes, <laughs> for exactly. sure. So for, for you know, 50, 60 years, cancer research really focused on how to treat the tumor. What's wrong with the tumor? How do we interfere with the ceaseless desire to divide that the tumor has? Um, immunotherapy looks at it from the other side. It's the patient. And what does the patient need to do to control the tumor? So I think Sean latched on to that very early. Um, he also recognized that, I mean, at the time he had a very uh, dear friend, Laura Ziskind, who was at that point where the standard treatment options for the disease that she had were running very low, and immunotherapy was at the time only an experimental option. Um, so Sean decided to focus on immunotherapy, and he also decided that he needed to empower many research groups to work together to get out of our silos and to collaborate. Um, and he needed to um, reward us for doing that in really uh, an important way, which is to provide us with research funding. Sure. Um, which is all too scarce. Um, we're very happy to hear about the moonshot, uh, but still there's, there's a lot more that needs to be done. So um, having us collaborate was really important. Um, the other very different aspect of this um, experiment, really, that Sean is doing, um, is that he is saying that he's quite good at um, recognizing the value of intellectual property that's generated. And so this research team's intellectual property should be developed for its own good. So the collective royalties, licensing fees that may or may not you know, be accumulated by the products of these six institutions um, are going to be redistributed among those six institutions um, to fuel this ongoing research effort to make this foundation that Sean and Alexandra put together um, evergreen and self-sustaining. I think what's shocking to a lot of people is you read about these alternate fundraising sources, whether it's Sean Parker or whether it's something like Cycle for Survival. What right. is... I didn't realize that medicine is similar to politics in that a fair amount of your time is spent fundraising, like a, a real percentage of your day or of your day of your week, whatever the measure, unit of measurement is, is spent trying to drum up money. Yeah, it's, it's been estimated that up to 30% of someone's time can be spent writing grants, reading grants, um, you know, looking for sources of funding. And um, I, I think for folks who run a small business or who run any kind of business, they recognize that, yeah, that's part of the job is to, is to you know, raise the money. But here, the people who are raising the money are also the people who are doing the work. Right. I think most people would prefer to have you doing the work. Not uh, because I'm, I'm sure you're a prolific <laughs> fundraiser, but the idea that you would actually be the person with the hat out is... It's important. I think an anathema to a lot of people who want to see cancer research uh, forward at the fastest rate possible. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, 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 in addition to the generous support from Sean Parker, from the NIH, from many organizations, I spend my summer weekends with an organization called Swim Across America, which does long-distance swims, including in Chicago here in the lake to raise money for cancer research. Um, cycle for survival. You know, I could be in really good shape. You know, <laughs> <if I would. laughs> um, but I think that there's a lot of our time that, that's actually spent. And it's, it's all for good. You know? Sure, sure, of course. Imp and it's very important. Um, I do want to ask you, when we talk, you raise an important point that we're now thinking of cancer not necessarily in terms of the tumor, but in terms of the patient. So the implicate, what, what do you think the implications are here broadly for personalized medicine? The, the simple answer 
to your really good question, is that immunotherapy is the ultimate form of personalized medicine. Sure. Because what we're doing when we give someone an immunotherapy medicine, like a PD-1 blocking drug like President Carter received, is you are taking the molecular breaks off that person's immune cells and letting them rev up faster and seek out a tumor and respond to it. So the way that an immune cell recognizes something is very, very specific. So this is a form of personalized medicine. It's just the medicine itself is not so personalized. Um, but I think we need to do a better job of understanding what the individual immunologic needs are right. of, a, of a patient and their cancer so that we can um, intervene in a much more specific way. Um, the targeted therapies, the medicines that uh, block the abnormal circuits, and um, you know there are a lot of these, there are BRAF inhibitors in melanoma, there are ALK inhibitors in lung cancer, many others that have been phenomenally successful because what happens is that we do some genetic testing on someone's tumor biopsy, which takes just a few days now beforehand, and we say, aha, this gene is abnormal in this tumor. This person needs this medicine. This is becoming a very common practice now, and it's revolutionized the way that we approach cancer therapy because no longer is it just about, oh, this looks like a breast cancer under the microscope. We're going to use this chemotherapy because that's what sometimes works in breast cancer. We're now getting much more um, precise about the way that we decide. We're not 100% there yet. How much do you think that the developments in oncology around immunotherapy are sort of being seen by doctors in other professions and informing other courses of treatments? Or, or to what degree is there a dialogue, I guess, between oncologists and other doctors? Uh, another really good question. Um, I think that around immunotherapy, we now have dialogue with many people who probably you know, never thought they would hear from us before. To give you an example, the side effects that we um, can create with immunotherapy can involve a long list of organs in the body, including the gastrointestinal tract, where we can create colitis in someone who never had it before. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, some of my best friends... So you've are, unlocked yes. colitis for some people. Exactly. So, but now I'm talking to gastroenterologists. One of the um, not so rare side effects of one of the immunotherapy medicines is attack of the pituitary gland, which is this little tiny endocrine gland that sits in the middle of your skull um, that is sort of the master regulator. That gland can become attacked by immune cells and up to 5% of people treated with immunotherapy and go away, such that people need multiple kinds of hormone replacement. So, I now need endocrinologists around me all the time to help me sort out how do you recognize these side effects, when do you replace which hormone. So these immune therapies are actually creating a lot of dialogue. Well, and I would assume it's useful information for the endocrinologists or gastroenterologists, right? Oh, you guys have figured out that this is a byproduct, therefore we can use it in reverse to prevent it or I, something. I think that it is. And in fact, there are some of the medicines that are currently being used to treat psoriasis and colitis that are essentially the opposite of the medicine that we're using. So you're absolutely right. I just, one of the most exciting sort of, I guess not byproducts, but over the feeling of discovery in, in immunotherapy in particular feels incredibly profound. I mean, would you say, I, I am obviously not a doctor, I don't play a medical professional on television, but when you think about this particular field of study, it feels incredibly rich in terms of the sort of like frontierism of medicine. Um, you're right. In the last five years, it has seemed revolutionary. Um, I, I think um, it was Dr. Lichtenfeld before who said, we need to look back also um, and realize that this frontier has been a very long time in coming. When we think back to where this field started, it's actually about 120 years ago, a surgeon in New York City who was seeing that cancer patients that he operated on um, who had infections after cancer surgery seemed to live longer than patients who didn't have infections in the 1890s. And he hypothesized that there was something about these infections that was stimulating 
a resistance force inside their body that was causing the cancer to stay away. Now that people didn't know from B cells and T cells and the immune system in the 1890s, but what he was talking about was immunotherapy. Um, that was very popular until about the 1920s when radiation came along and it seemed so much more elegant to beam an invisible stream of electrons into a tumor than to inject it with bacteria. Um, and so it really took us a long time to be acknowledged as a scientific breakthrough, um, as a field, um, because the underlying basic science was still being worked out. And I can't stress enough that the investment that was made in basic science over the past 50 or 60 years to understand how the immune system operates separate from cancer, just how do immune cells go about their business, what turns them on, what turns them off, etc., um, incredibly important because that's what gave rise to these therapies. That's fascinating that it was going on as early as the turn of the last century. Um, we have time for one or two quick questions from the audience if you want to raise your hand over here and uh, maybe give your name and affiliation. I'm sorry, what? Introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Noelle Osborne. Um, I thought perhaps that today we'd hear something about the new viral treatments with the polio virus and the AIDS virus. Any comments on that? Yeah, so there's been a lot of interest in using viruses to treat cancer. There were some stories recently in the press about polio virus and brain tumors, and I think that it's it's important to recognize that that has a connection with immunotherapy as well, that um, there are now, there's an approved medicine for metastatic melanoma, which involves injecting a disabled herpes virus into melanoma tumors to, to make them go away. Because again, remember what I told you before, the immune system sees structure, not function. So if all of a sudden the melanoma tumor looks like a herpes virus, the immune system is going to run in and say, this is something that I'm supposed to recognize as being dangerous and I'm going to get rid of it. Um, so, you know, I think what's old is new again, um, you know, because when we think back to the story I just told you about Dr. Coley and his bacterial infections, now we have new medicines being approved that are basically based upon viruses being injected into tumors. In the back. My name's uh, <clears throat> Tom Dittmar. I actually uh, have multiple myeloma, and my, uh, I've been through a lot of chemo, uh, just recently relapsed from a stem cell bone marrow transplant, and my questions along those lines as well. Uh, there have been a lot of terrific programs. I, I, it seems like immunotherapy has taken this amazing leap. Vice, 60 Minutes, and PBS have done these amazing stories on immunotherapies and histories of cancers and so forth. One of the, uh, 60 Minutes just recently did uh, an update from what's going on over at Duke University in immunotherapies. And some, the, the one new thing that got me very excited, and I wondered if you could speak to, was uh, by accident they found out through treating uh, some young man, I can't remember who he was, but uh, with immunotherapy, it began to shrink his tumor, because they're doing geoblastoma, I believe. And it came back, started coming back. So they went to his, they thought it was failed. They went back to his normal regimen of chemo. And what they found was now somehow, for some reason, the chemo knocked the cancer out, like as though the immunotherapy had just punched it up and, and you know, delivered some blow. You've mentioned multi-drug therapies. That's become important with my cancer. Uh, I know it's important with uh, some of the other cancers that were mentioned now and have made them more effective. Is that something that's being considered and looked at more? I imagine it is at Duke, but anywhere else. Yes, thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great point, that sometimes we see unexpectedly good responses to treatments that you might not imagine would work after immunotherapy. And there are a lot of reasons why we think that happens, but we're not yet certain why. So you might imagine that if we've turned on the immune system and then we give some chemotherapy, chemotherapy works by stopping the division of cancer cells. And so if some of those cells die, they release debris, which could look 
different to the immune system, and now with the immune system tuned up in the background, it then can recognize this as being a good target. Um, chemotherapy can also change the vicinity around where tumors grow and deplete some um, inhibitory immune cells. So we've, we've seen this as well, where people who get chemotherapy that you have very low expectations for will all of a sudden have dramatic responses on the heels of immunotherapy. So again, a good reason why we're now focusing on combinations. And uh, we need to be very careful about the way that we approach this, because we need to study what to give when. What is the sequence of which treatment do you give before the other one? Dr. Walshuk, it is a fascinating field of study. You. You're at the forefront of it. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you very much.